Good morning. Can we just say how much we appreciate those who entered the waters of baptism today? Just one more time. Yeah. Uh, I think most of you are aware we're actually in a series uh, talking about the Holy Spirit, and today I wanted to pivot away from that uh, just for a Sunday to talk about some of the things that, uh, as a nation, we are processing. The, the news has been tragic, and uh, most of the responses that we see um, are fearful and angry. And uh, I understand both of those emotions. But I think they are inadequate for being able to move forward, both in terms of our individual faith and in terms of our nation. And uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about this. I, I'm not here to uh, make you more angry or more afraid. In my view, there's plenty of that happening already. I want to challenge you to consider engaging in and employing spiritual resources, because I do believe that that actually makes a difference. Um, we see uh, headlines and we hear breaking news and, and our faith does not ignore tragic events. Like We're not trying to pretend like really difficult things are not happening in our world. Our faith actually responds to tragic events. And we're not here to uh, hold out until problems are solved or get better, just kind of huddle up and hope we're safe in our little space. Uh, we're here to access the resources of our faith and to be a resource to others in our culture. I actually think it's not the news that's breaking. I think our world is breaking, and I think that we're seeing it in the news. Uh, last Monday, uh, before the most recent tragic events, I happened to be with a group of pastors, one of which was a pastor in Sandy Hook. Uh, you may be aware of what happened there a decade ago. This was before the events that took place in Texas. And what he told me is 10 years later, that community still has not healed. Can you imagine how they felt on Tuesday? Uh, two years ago, our nation wish, uh, witnessed a black man suffocated to death while he cried out for help and while smartphones captured the details. And it is true that people responsible for his death have been held accountable, but that is not the same to say that there is healing that has occurred. And two years, closing in on the two-year anniversary of that reality, a man walks into Buffalo, New York, and into a grocery store, and his target is entirely based on the color of a person's skin. And uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, because of where we live, he had actually intended to target Rochester rather than Buffalo, and came for that purpose in February. He targeted specific churches that he wanted to go into because they were known for uh, being communities of ethnic. And so he wanted to target them. And one of the reasons that he did not carry out his plan is because it was so cold in February and people wear so many coats and, and sweaters. He had a hard time telling which ethnicity a person was. Um, last Tuesday, a young man headed into a Texas school and he took the lives of 21 people, 19 of them were children. When things like this happen, it affects us, and I've listened to lots of conversations over the last couple of weeks, and what I've heard is, is uh, some of our brothers and sisters who are people of color now go into a grocery store on hyper alert. There are parents who are now deeply concerned about sending their children to school. Teachers, students, parents, all having to deal with wondering how they can keep their children safe and how they can communicate to their children that they are safe. And it, it, 
and this is not the only news that we're getting, the largest Protestant organization in the world. So you got the Catholic Church, the largest Protestant organization. Their leadership is under fire because they fail to protect children and other adults in their churches, and they fail to hold its ministers accountable for the crimes that they were committing. They were sexually terrorizing people in their organization. And that's not all. War rages. There's more wars than the one we hear the most about. There's over 30 wars. And by war, that literally a major war is considered any place where more than 10,000 people die. They call it a minor war if it's between 1,000 and 9,999. They call it a minor conflict if somewhere between 100 and 999 deaths. And that's not all. There's drug overdose, overdoses and there's suicides. And, and what we hear commonly is a call for a moment of silence and that our thoughts are with you. And a call for a moment of silence is appropriate when you've lost someone. That's true, but it's an insufficient response for those who remain. And I don't think our fears or our anger is helping. There's not a shortage in our world right now of blame or of fear or of anger. There's not a shortage of grief or sorrow or despair. I do think there is a shortage of prayer. I do think that. Prayer is the way we can become useful to God in the heartbreaking situations we are observing. Even when we don't have words, because I've, I've looked at some of these situations and I've tried to start a conversation with God and, and I'm tongue tied. I, what words do you use? And there's this great passage in scripture, we're gonna look at it, but it says he can use even our wordless groans and our deep sighs. God can use even that. What he can't use is our anger and our fear. We have to learn to convert our headlines into prayer. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Too many people only quote verse 28, and verse 28 is not true if we don't engage in verses 26 and 27. We do not know that all things work together for good if we do not pray. Verse 28 starts with and. And and means it's connected to the previous thoughts. Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter, puts it this way. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. As a church, we have to appreciate. We have to take ownership of our own stuff. We, we want everyone else to take responsibility. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then God heals our land. How many does have the impression this morning that our land is in need of healing? Yeah, I think that's true. So the goal of prayer is actually not just for us to feel better. By the way, that's not the goal of this message either. And some of you have already figured that out because you're here and you're not feeling better yet. Prayer is actually how we rebel against the status quo of evil and wickedness. There's two primary goals in prayer. The first is God's kingdom to come. Why? Because our kingdom usually serves us really well. The things we agree with, the things we like, the things we support, the things we pursue, they usually work well for us, but that doesn't mean it works well for everyone. Secondly, is we want God's will to be done. There's often a difference between our will and God's will. God's will is done in heaven, that's why it's heaven. Our will is done on earth with serious consequences. 
serious consequences. Um, this is what we know. Racial terrorism, loss of life in a school is not God's will. I want to say that again, just in case you didn't know. It's not God's will that people are targeted because of the color of their skin or that someone walks into a school with weapons of mass destruction. That's not God's will. That's the will of a person being imposed on others. It's something to think about when we're advocating for someone else's will to be imposed. I can easily assume if everybody would just do things the way I do things, the world would be better. It'd be better for me. But not everything that's better for me is better for you or others. As well-intended as our kingdoms are, as well-intended as our wills may be, they are actually insufficient for the challenges we face or for the future that we desire. Prayer is not about giving up on things. It's not about giving up control. It's about inviting God to take control. This is not a call to passivity. It's a call to discernment and to obedience. Prayer is how we, it's not how we impose our will. It's how we invite God's will. I've seen people kind of try to impose their will. If they, if they can start with Heavenly Father and end with, in Jesus' name, amen, they think they can sneak stuff in there that God might not be paying attention to. It's not how it works. What I do want to call our attention to is there are lots of focus points in the news that we hear day by day, but uh, there's something else I want us to talk about that you won't hear on the news, and that is don't ignore the spiritual battle. Don't ignore the spiritual battle. There's more going on than actually meets the eye. There's spiritual reality in our world. There are spiritual forces. Jesus said that the evil one comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He never changes his agenda. He never gets tired. He never takes a break. There are real spiritual forces. And I'm aware that when I say that, that sounds naive to modern people. But ignoring the spiritual component of life ignores what is the root of evil, and it also ignores the potential of evil. We have to approach these things with a spiritual perspective. We can easily focus on the effects of spiritual conflict, but it, there's a lot of wisdom in starting to focus on the, the cause rather than just the effects. What are the things that are driving this? Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 12th verse, puts it this way. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. People are not your problem. So, oh, you don't know some of my people. <laughs> No, they're not the problem. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil day comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. What's our armor? Our armor is truth. Not just the facts that you find that support an opinion that you have. Truth is actually the nature of reality, how things actually work. We can believe things that do not align with the nature of reality, how the world actually works, how spiritual things actually work. And we will constantly be running into brick walls if we don't pay attention to what is truth. Righteousness. Righteousness is our access and standing with God. And what we know is, is that our access and standing with God is based on what he has done for us, not what has been done by us. And I'll tell you why that's important. Because when you're praying about really important things, you will always think of a reason you are disqualified to ask anything from God. You will remember the thing you did or didn't do, the thing you said or didn't say. All of these things will percolate up. When I come before God, I don't stand before him because I am good. I stand before him because he is good and he opened the door and he made the invitation and he's interested in what's going on in our lives and in our world. Uh, peace. Uh, peace doesn't just steady you, it readies you. It orients you for action. It says you put on Peace, like you put on shoes to get ready for the battle. Peace makes you ready. And then faith. Faith is simply trusting in the heart and the ways of God. Trust in the heart and the ways of God. 
The question I have is, who do you trust more than God? And salvation, the helmet of salvation, that's the, salvation is the knowledge that we're being rescued. We've all seen rescue movies, right? And we've all seen rescues on television, in the news. And, the, and, and we cheer when a rescue occurs. Do you remember when the plane landed in the Hudson River in New York City? And all of them came out alive? And the pilot was a hero? And we all watched those people step out onto the wings of a plane floating in a river. And we knew that's not how planes are, that's not where they're supposed to be. It's supposed to be up in the sky, not in the river. And, and so we, we look at those things, but they, they made it out. And, and people came and they helped them. And, and the worst thing possible is to give up on being rescued just before the rescue occurs. And the helmet of salvation is the knowledge. I'm, God is in the act of rescuing me. Hold on. And God's word, which he describes as a sword. God's word is his will and his wisdom. And we need a sword like this just to cut down a lot of the false assumptions that we have about him, about our world, even about ourselves. We need something that can cut through the confusion and the deception. And then prayer. Prayer is the way we are alert and we respond. Prayer is how God gives us agency in our world. Without agency, we can't act. Um, God calls us to pray because prayer makes a difference. We're not spectators. We're not observers. We are engaged in meaningful action. The disciples actually asked Jesus to teach them to pray, and he was glad to do it. And the way they would pray would change their lives. They would pray until buildings actually shook. They would pray. By the way, I got to tell you this story. I was uh, speaking in a service one time, uh, not here in Rochester, but I was speaking in a service, and there were some people who came in to disrupt the service. I know you're stunned by that, and it couldn't possibly happen in today's world, but it did. It happened to me. And I'm standing up in the front, and what are you supposed to do? And so I just asked everybody, I said, everyone, would you just pray for these people? And the place I was in, they don't do the, the little polite praying thing that we're more comfortable with here. You know, the, oh, Father, please. <laughs> I mean, they, they, when they pray, volume comes out. And it unsettled those interrupters. And they fled the building like they were, <laughs> like they were afraid. Prayer made the difference. Uh, the disciples would pray until cells were opened and their friends were released. They would pray until their shadows actually healed the sick. They would pray until they received revelations that would shape the paradigms of their culture. They would pray even for those who tortured and tormented. So here's some advice for praying in case you want to try it. Very clear advice, all right? Number one, keep it simple. Keep, is, keep your prayers simple. Complicating prayers only makes it harder to access prayer. You don't wear God down by your many words. He's not counting them. He's not a, he's not a teacher or a professor in college. And oh, look at that. You missed your 10,000 word essay by five words. And so you, you fail. That's, that's not how it works. By the way, he's not counting the syllables either. It's not big words that move God. Prevailing prayer is when we ask plainly and we ask clearly and we ask specifically. Keep it simple. Secondly, keep it real. Keep it real. Prayer doesn't exempt you from challenges in life, and prayer doesn't work when we pretend anything. The reason where prayer works, as I've already mentioned, is not because we are good, but it is because God is good. It is not because we have power, it's because he has power. It's not because we know everything that needs to happen, it's because he knows everything that needs to happen. And when you pray, just have honest emotions. I stood behind a woman whose son is in one of the neighboring NATO countries right now of the major conflict that's happening in the world regarding Ukraine. And he could get called into action at any given moment. And the person at the front of the room was asking us to pray regarding the conflict that's happening in Ukraine. And I'm standing behind this woman whose son is on the lines. And I will tell you, she prayed different than anybody else in the room. She wasn't making that up. If that was your child that was there, you would pray different too. This idea that we have to hype people up in order for God to take us seriously. 
that we have to pretend anything. Keep it simple. Keep it real. It's okay to use your imagination. When I heard her praying, this is what I thought to myself. She cares a lot more about this situation in, in Ukraine than I do. And I get it that she's got a son that's closer. I don't have a son that's out there. But I'm wondering if I did, how might I pray? And then I tried to pray like that. That's something worth doing. Hype and hypocrisy. Do not activate heaven on our behalf. And then keep it up. Keep it simple. Keep it real. Keep it up. Jesus said he actually taught a parable in Luke 18 where he says he gave his, his disciples a parable so that, to show them how they could always pray and not lose heart. Even when I don't see anything changing, I can still pray. Even when I don't feel anything is changing, I can still pray. I can show faith that I, I show my faith by asking again. Well, nothing's changing. Persevere. And my perseverance isn't because I'm stubborn. My perseverance is because I do trust the heart of God to do what is right and to actually be for people and not against them. So I want to talk to you for just a couple minutes about praying the headlines. Praying the headlines. Okay. Natural disasters. When you're seeing a natural disaster unfold, who's being harmed? Who is lacking resources? What do they need? Use your imagination. Put yourself in their situation. What would you need? And then, who can help? What do they need? Pray that. Terrorism. Someone unleashes an act of evil, not only intending to take life, but to make those who live afraid. Who has been harmed? Who is at risk? What do they need? They have families. They have friends. What do they need? There's someone in authority who could intervene. What do they need? When you know what people need, you know what to pray. Keep it real. Keep it simple. How about health? Who is ill? Who is at risk? What do they need? Who is helping? What do they need? Injustice. Who has suffered loss? Who's being targeted? What do they need? What do they need? Who could help? What do they need? Jobs, economy, poverty. Who's being impacted? It's, it's real easy to see, oh, those people. That's not helpful. It's not helpful. What do they need? Who could help? And I'm just going to throw this out there. If you want to delay your prayer until your preferred political party is in place, you're not of help to the kingdom of God. People need help. Doesn't matter what party's in control. I want God to intervene in people's lives. I'm not just looking for someone else to win an election. Military conflict, who's being attacked? What do they need? Who's being injured? Who's being misplaced? What do they need? Who is in position to help? What do they need? Sexual assault, who has been assaulted? What do they need? Who can help? What do they need? Who needs to be held accountable and responsible for their actions? We can pray for justice in those situations. So this morning, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, John, who's our worship director, to lead a prayer. I'm going to ask Jonathan, who's our executive pastor, to lead a prayer. And then I'm going to lead a prayer. And here's what I want you to think about. I do not want this to be just a room listening while someone prays. I want us to engage in prayer. Your voice matters. Well, Pastor, I'm shy. Yep, I am too. And look at me. I'm up here with a microphone and everything. Your voice matters. Your voice can make a difference. So when other people are leading, if you want to, you can pray your own prayer. Like God, God can actually listen to more than one person at a time. Yeah? You think that's true? 
I do. I can't. I can only listen to one person at a time. God can, can listen to more than one person at a time. Or you can do this. They might say something that, that you agree with. Do you think that's important? And you can just say yes. You can say, please, Lord, do that. Just vocalize in some way. There are times when, honestly, the only thing I can get out of my mouth is the name of the person who's rescued me. I'll just say, Jesus. I see events like the ones we've seen in recent history, as close as Buffalo and as far as Texas, places around the world. And I have these odd emotions that start mixing inside of me. And it is so easy to assume that there's nothing I can do. And there is, and it matters. And I'm hearing voices who are raising up right now and say, well, people are, people are calling for prayer. We don't need that. That's not making any difference. People aren't praying. They're posting. They're ranting. They're fearing. And every single one of those things that we have a natural tendency towards, we can convert that to a conversation with God. And when we do that, it makes a difference. So I'm going to ask us all to stand. And I'm going to ask you, right now in God's kingdom, be useful. That when you hear someone lifting something that you agree with, or you think you have something to add to, add your voice to that. Specifically, we pray over every family uh, who has lost someone in, in the impacts of the past couple weeks. We don't ask that you would take their grief away, but we do ask that you would let them know that they never grieve alone. Uh, that you are, you are still the God who saves the crushed in spirit and you're close to the broken heart and you're close to them now. And we ask for any family member or any person who is uh, afraid now uh, to go to school or to go to the grocery store uh, or to send their own child to school, um, we ask that you would come against that fear and that though they may have those feelings internally, that peace would rule over those things, that it would be a peace that passes all understanding because it's a peace that comes from you. We ask for healing and wholeness, not that we would forget, but that we would be made whole in you as a country and as a community and as people. God, this morning, I want to lift up the family members of the perpetrators who did these horrible acts in Buffalo, in Texas. And God, we've got a culture that uh, wants to pile on shame and to point a finger at someone. And God, today, I'm praying that you would wrap your loving arms around your children, that they may feel that there is still hope, and uh, that you would comfort their hearts that are probably filled with all kinds of confusion. God, I pray for the grandma of one of the shooters that you would help heal her body and then uh, heal her heart and her soul. And God, I even want to pray for the shooter who is still alive. And God, honestly, it's hard for us to pray for those who, who feel like our enemies. Um, but God, you are a God who can redeem even the hardest of hearts. And so even though it's sometimes hard for us to even believe that or agree with that, God, I, I do pray that you would intervene into that young man's heart and meet him where he is and change his heart. 
I ask in your humble name. Uh, Father, I know in, in Buffalo, one of the people had just come from the nursing home where they diligently sit beside their spouse and spend time with them every day even though they can't care for them the way they want to. That person is gone. Would you replace them with someone in that spouse's life? But more than that, would you raise up <laughs> an army of people that would now find ways to serve those who are not able to care for themselves? And there was a person who who they were engaged to be married and their future is gone. There's a person who had hopes and dreams and all of that is broken. Will you comfort her? Uh, but will you also raise up people who are willing to make commitments, not run from them? There was a, a precious lady for 25 years. She has served in a soup kitchen, going into a park to make sure people who don't have food had food, would you raise up an army of people to take her place so that no one is left out? In fact, Father, I know that when painful things come, sometimes they tear us apart, but sometimes they bring us together. Would you use every tragedy that we have to face in our world to bring us more and more together rather than tearing us apart? We ask that in the mighty name of Jesus and all who agreed with those prayers said, Amen. Amen.